Okay, does everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, go ahead. All right, so the other thing I wanna say is, uh, please stay with me. It's a lot of information here, but you're gonna hear some new things, some suggestions I have, some things that you will not read in the papers here in the United States. So please stick with me. And then again, we have the uh, question session and I hope I have the answers to all your questions. So this is the intro. Okay, there I am. Um, so I just told you in 1961 and what happened after I visited the museum. Then um, a year later in 1962 on Dutch TV, appeared a series called The Occupation. This was done by the head of the Royal Institute of War Documentation in the Netherlands. This man is fantastic, a Dr. De Jong. He had researched everything about those five years of war, not only the Netherlands itself, but also Indonesia, which had been occupied by the Japanese after Pearl Harbor. So uh, I continued to read about it, stayed interested, and then I came to the United States and in 1995 with my family. So there was the four of us. Uh, we went to visit the Anne Frank Museum again in Amsterdam. And I got a private tour by somebody from the foundation I had become friendly with. And not part of the regular tour now is he showed me Otto Frank's office that exactly was there when Otto Frank left for Switzerland in 1952. And the man in front of the foundation told me nothing had been changed. That was a kind of eerie, obviously, um, because there was papers on the desk. There was a typewriter, if I recall. So nothing had changed there. And outside that office, there was a bathroom. And on Saturdays, the girls would uh, go in the bathtub Edith Frank would take care of for Anne and her sister. So a lot of help I got from David Barnow in Amsterdam. He's the foremost authority on the Anne Frank story in the whole world. He has written books about that. And uh, I will mention the books at the end. You can get them on Amazon. So let's go forward now. So we're gonna start talking about Otto. Otto Frank was born in 1889 in Frankfurt on Main. On mine means the river mine. It was the second child of uh, Fritz and Alice Frank Stern. He had an older brother, Robert, younger brother, Herbert, and a sister, Lenny, with whom he was very close his whole life. Uh, they were typical. They were in the banking business. They were typical German Jews. He was not bar mitzvah. I mean, this... In Germany, they had a different idea about the religion, good or bad, that's the way they were, than, for instance, in Poland and in Russia, and as most of you know, they were much more religious. We go to the next one. Okay. Um, so, he goes to, uh, that, that's left out here, but uh, I will just fill you in. After high school, and he did what's called in uh, Europe the gymnasium, gymnasium, which is a higher type of high school. We have in Europe the two tiers of high school, and he went to the highest type. Uh, we don't have the college system in Europe uh, like you have it here. So he went to the University of Heidelberg, not too far from uh, Frankfurt, and uh, he met there a guy by the name of Nathan Strauss. Now, Strauss, with most of you, are going to ring a bell because Nathan Strauss was from New York. And his father owned a famous department store. I guess you can say it already. No, nobody can figure it out. Macy's. His father started and owned Macy's. So they became friends. And uh, Nathan Strauss uh, invited him to come to New York. So Otto went to New York, he left from Hamburg, the big port city, but within days of arriving, unfortunately, he got a telegram that his father had suddenly died. So he had to go back immediately, but after the funeral arrangements, he came back to New York. And 
uh, there, he got a very busy social life. He was involved with Nathan. They lived in the Upper East Side. German Jews, especially the ones who had done well, uh, for some of you who are from New York, you will know that, the Upper East Side was where the German Jews lived. The Lower East Side were the Russians, uh, the Polish and the Romanian Jews lived. And they typically didn't m mingle. So he got, Otto got, uh, you know, to hang out with uh, some very important socialized in New York. Among them, the Brooklyn tack of the Rothschilds from Frankfurt. There was a whole bunch of them living in New York. Anyway, he stayed there for about two years. And he decided that America was not really for him. So let's remember that because that's going to come back later on. He went back to Germany in 1911 and accepted a job as a metal construction company in Dusseldorf, which is all the way in the Ruhrgebiet on the west side of Germany, not too far from the Dutch border. Now, why he suddenly went with a metal construction company uh, that uh, the book where they relied on doesn't say. Anyway, so now we're in 1914 and the war breaks out. Um, World War I. He was drafted in 1915. There was already heavy fighting going on on the Western Front. In 1918, he was promoted to lieutenant. And after the armistice in 1918 in Versailles, if you all remember, he returns to Frankfurt. So we go to the next one now. Oops. Uh, go too far? No, no, we're fine. So in 1919, uh, his mother, by the way, his mother had been running the business uh, during the war because his older brother, Robert, also was drafted. So in Herbert, I don't think it was in Frankfurt at that time. He was out of Germany. So the mother had to run the business. She did as best as she could, but they had lost a, a lot of money during the war. Uh, in 1920, so Otto took over the banking business. 1921, he meets Eric Elias, who marries his sister Lenny. And Eric Elias started to work for the banking business of the Frank family in Frankfurt. Then in 1923, because of his American experience, Otto Frank was asked to open a branch of the family bank in Amsterdam. So that's really the first time he went to Amsterdam, 1923. And uh, things didn't go to well. They were also uh, trading in uh, foreign valuta. Uh, it, it didn't go to well. So in 1924, uh, the bank was liquidated. Okay, so now we go to the next one. Okay, now. 1925, he's 36 years old. He was still single. That was unheard of in those days. So, but he met, uh, through some other people, he met his wife, Edith Hollander, and she was from the city of Aachen, which is right over the Dutch border. Um, much later, he admitted to his second wife that his marriage to Edith was virtually a business arrangement. But that's the way it was in 1925. Uh, she was also from a much more religious family. They observed the Shabbat, all Jewish holidays. They kept her kosher home. So people in Edith's family were really shocked that she married Otto, who maybe once in his life he had been in a synagogue, and that's about it. So we're going to the next one. Okay, then the children were born in 1926, Margot hence older sister, and here she is, 1929, lovely Anne was born on June the 12th. Go to the next one. Okay, here they are again, Margot on the left, and on the right, this is Edith with Margot standing and, and she holding Anne in her hands. Okay, so in 1933, Otto decided, you know, the climate in Germany is not, is not good for Jews. Uh, the Nazis had come to power, Hitler became a Reich uh, Chancellor, and uh, it, the signs on the wall were not very good, so he wanted to leave. 
And he opened a business in Amsterdam called Opecta. What they did is they produced a product called pectin. Some of you ladies there probably know what pectin is. If you want to make jams or jellies, then you need to use pectin to make the taste perfect. And that was a good business. And why was that? Because this is not like nowadays where you can just, it's cold outside, you can go to the supermarket, you can buy strawberries, blueberries. That was out of the question in those days. So there was a lot of canning going on by Dutch uh, women and uh, other people did that. It was a good business. So Opecta. Now, what he said before he left, and this is very telling about Otto, the world around me has collapsed. But most people in my country changed into nationalistic, rough, anti-Semitic criminals. I had to face the consequences. And although it settled me deeply, I realized that Germany was no longer my country and I was forced to leave for good. So he went in the beginning of 1933 to set up the business, Opecta. And at the end of the year, the whole family had moved into a new apartment in the river quarters in the south of Amsterdam. It was called the river quarters because all the streets were named after Dutch rivers. It was a very nice area. It's still there. So up to that time, all the Jews in Amsterdam lived in the inner city, near the synagogues, uh, so they could walk over there on Shabbat. But little by little, people wanted to move out. You know, the canals were polluted. Uh, it was not always a good environment to be there in that inner city. And so a lot of Jews moved to this area. Okay, we got to the next one. So here they are, uh, 1934, Margot at Tenzer School. It's the same school I went to in 1957. And I think the school is still there. I visited it several years ago, but it was still there. And Anne goes to the Montessori school. You see the picture on the right, her face is circled. And now it is properly named the Anne Frank School. Uh, they settled into a regular Dutch life. So there was ice skating on the many canals and ponds in the winter. And in the summer trips to Zandvoort, which is exactly the seaside uh, resort and the Dutch equivalent of Ocean City. On the picture there, to the right, you see the two girls with Edith to the right. I do not know who the city, the woman is uh, sitting in the chair, the beach chair. Okay. Okay, so then unfortunately, September the 1st, 1939, World War II started. The Queen of the Netherlands, Wilhelmina, which is seen in the picture lower left, had declared time and again, and again, that the Netherlands would observe strict neutrality, just as she has done in 1914. A lot of Dutch people believed her and thought that we would not get involved. Well, unfortunately, they were all wrong. On May the 10, 1940, the Netherlands were invaded by 22 well-armed German divisions. The Dutch could barely put up one and a half division. It was an uneven fight from day one. We, we barely had an Air Force. Uh, and uh, on the fourth day, May the 14th, the Germans uh, threatened to bomb the city of Rotterdam. And we invited them to come talk, you know, to prevent that. And they claim falsely, I think, that they never got that communication. And so the Germans bombed the city of Rotterdam. And about a thousand people unfortunately lost, lost their life. So now the country is occupied by the Germans. Pretty quiet in 1940, but then in 1941, there was uh, some troubles, mostly in Amsterdam, there was a huge strike. Uh, I will not go into all the uh, particulars about that, but a life started to get difficult for the Jewish population. Uh, and then there came an edict that Jews could no longer uh, be in business, own a business. So he had to transfer the ownership of his two companies to two Dutch managers. I forgot to mention, besides the Opecta, he had opened a spice company also 
to cover for the slow winter months. So we had really, he owned two businesses. And that's when Otto Frank had seen the handwriting on the wall, started to make preparations slowly for the family to go in hiding into the annex. Now, what is an annex? And we will see the pictures later on. It was very well done. By the way, this is all done by my eldest daughter, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. You did an outstanding job. So yeah. the annex, in Dutch, it's called the Achterhuis. It means the house behind the house. The Prinsenkracht was built in uh, the 17th century, early 1600s, I think it was. So every time they dig out a canal, then they build houses. So real estate was at a premium. It was very expensive to build because the soil was very soft. So somebody came with a very luminous idea, very smart, said, well, we built one house. Instead of putting gardens behind it, why don't we build another house behind it? And another family could live there with storage space. So another family could have a business there. Very bright. And that's what they did. So that's when... Otto bought 263 Prinzenkraft. He had actually two houses already. Okay, um, so he continued to do the preparations for to go into hiding. In June the 12th, 1942 was Anne's 13th birthday and she received a book to start a diary. It's, we have a picture of that later on. Otto Frank tells the family on the same day that he's making serious preparation for them to go into hiding. So we go to the next one. Uh, in the beginning of July, the 16th, I mean, in the beginning of July, I think it was July the 6th, the 16 year old Margot Frank receives a summons to report to the SS for deportation, deportation to a German labor camp. And Otto Frank said, of course, absolutely not. And he made the decision there uh, that they go into hiding. So actually it was July the 6th. It was a Sunday morning at six o'clock in the morning. They all got on the bicycle and they went to the annex. Meanwhile, Otto had made sure that there was beds, there was kitchen equipment, there was everything you needed to live. He made sure that was there. And he did a very smart thing. Uh, they had a cat, which I had to leave behind. So he put a notice under the door of one of his neighbors, uh, please take care of my cat. We have gone to Switzerland. So that was the word. That's what everybody knew in Amsterdam, except of course the people that helped uh, when they were in hiding, uh, that they had uh, moved to Switzerland. Um, so here they were, the four of them were there already. Then shortly after they were there, a business associate of Otto Frank, Herman von Pels, asked if he could join them with his wife, Gusti, and the son, Peter. Otto Frank would have said easily, no. You know, this is our my house, and it's risky to take more people in, I think. But here he comes in, and this is what I mean is, he's a righteous Jew. So he said, finally, he talked to the family, Okay, so now instead of four, there's seven people, almost double. Means double the amount of food they had to get, other things they had to get from the helpers, books, you know, they needed books, study books, etc. More noise, of course. And investigators after the war have concluded that almost certainly because Otto Frank took in fellow Jews that it mo almost certainly has contributed to the betrayal. And uh, that's very sad, but that's why I call him a righteous Jew, because I don't know if any other Jewish family that was in hiding at that time in the Netherlands would do the same thing. I, there might be stories out there. I have not heard of them. So again, it was a righteous Jew. So now there's seven living in the annex. Okay, we go to the next one. Okay, so here are the people in hiding. So on the top left, we start Edith Frank, Otto Frank, Hermann von Pels, the wife Auguste, and the son Peter. 
and bottom left Margot and Anne, of course. So on the top right, you see Fritz Pfeffer, the dentist. So now they went into hiding in July and this happened in November of 42. Uh, somehow through an acquaintance, he found out that this man was looking for a place to hide. Now again, Otto could have easily said, no, we already have seven people here. It's, it's gonna be, you know, yeah, there were three levels, three floors, and there was the attic, and you will see it shortly in the, in the, in the video. But again, he became a righteous Jew. Now, there was also, it was a very smart decision, Otto Frank, because Fritz Pfeffer was a dentist. And as uh, some of you know out there who are either dentists or medical doctors, the first three years of the study is basically the same for a dentist and a doctor, medical doctor. So he came in with his big bag, with all his tools, he had medicine, etc. So in case there was an emergency, they had a doctor living with them because they could not go out on the street. You had to carry, first of all, what we call in Dutch a PV, an identity card, you would call it here, with picture, and there would be the big J all over the identity card. So if they would have been stopped, uh, you know, anybody that was sick, uh, that, that was for Jews, immediate deportation to one of the Dutch transit camp. So again, now instead of four, they have eight people. So they need to get the helpers, and we get to that in a minute, needed to get double the amount of food, double the amount of everything. Now in those days, it's not like here now, you just walk in the supermarket and you grab everything. No, there was the grocery store that had just groceries, dry goods. For the meat, you need to go to a butcher. For the vegetables, you need to go to a vegetable store. For bread, you need to go to a bakery, etc. Can you imagine these two helpers that almost every day they had to get food, three meals, and uh, it, it was a lot, of, uh, a lot of work, obviously, but they did amazingly well. Okay, so we go to the next one now. Here are the helpers. The first two, three actually are managers. And Victor Kugler and Johannes Kleiman, those are the people uh, Otto had uh, written his business over to. So the real helpers were Beb Foskow, the top right, Mipchis, uh, was married to Jan Gies, actually. Mipchis was from Austria, Vienna, came after World War I to Amsterdam and stayed there. And uh, she was a big help, it was the office manager. Jan Gies, worked for the Amsterdam Social Social Services. So he he got the extra coupons uh, where they could buy more uh, groceries with, so whatever they needed. Okay, so we go on to the next one. Okay, so just uh, for you who know Amsterdam, you see in the top in the middle, the central railroad station is still there. And if you go down, you see the, the other red dot is the Dam Square, where the old Royal Palace is and the National Monument we have there. And not too far from there, you see the red, uh, the square is uh, the, uh, the house on 263 Prinzengracht, where they were in hiding. So not too far from there. And where they were living is all the way to the bottom left of the picture, that's where they had uh, their, uh, before they went into hiding, they lived there. Okay, let's move on. So here a picture again of 260, you see highlighted there, that's a 263 Prinzengracht, you see the canal there, and here is the Wester Tower, famous Wester Tower, if you remember, Anne writes about it in the diary, she could hear uh, the clocks going every hour on the hour and every half hour and sometimes it kept them awake at night. But this is where the house was, where everything happened. Okay. So this is a picture of uh, the, uh, the annex again. And let's go to the next one because that's more interesting. So you see, it was a three level here. Uh, and to the right is where uh, now, it, 
you can look outside, but in those days that you could not look outside, obviously it was all covered. Uh, that's uh, there is a desk with I think other words from that desk. There is the dining room. Here is a bathroom, and this is the room where Anne and Margot slept. And uh, you see on the wall, you see the the uh, pictures there, and everything is still there as far as I know. I haven't been there in years, but oops, we go to the next one. Okay, this is uh, one of the storerooms, the old copper kettles. And it was all refurbished, obviously. Oops, next one. Okay, here is the infamous bookcase. So if you remember when you walk in the uh, 263 Prinzelkracht and you go up the little stairs, this is the first thing you see, the bookcase. And now it's swing open, but so you only saw those books. So it looked like there was nothing behind there. And that was done on purpose, of course. Okay. Okay, that is the desk where Margot worked from. There is her diary in the middle. There are some of the pictures, the royal family, uh, Princess Elizabeth, now Queen Elizabeth. And that's where she did her homework. Okay, uh, they all had to share one bathroom. This was it. So you can imagine, and, and you hear in the video that's coming up how that was all done. Okay, uh, now you can click on that, I think. Wait, it's not working. No, it's not working. Maybe. Okay. Yes, you just have to click. Uh, I don't think it's appearing. Okay, what's happening? It's not. It's not working. I think you should just send it to everybody at the end. Okay, let's. Let's go to the video. Is not appearing. Let's go to the next one. Soil pipe ran right through the warehouse. Okay, let me. Father, quiet, Otto. I'm gonna stop here. It's 8.30. Come here now. You can't run the water anymore. Walk quietly. Even after the helpers started work in the office above the warehouse, the people in hiding still had to be quiet. By then, any noises from the hiding place heard in the warehouse would seem to come from the office. Can you stop the video? They would spend the rest of the morning reading, studying, and preparing lunch. Anne was doing a stenography course together with Margot and Peter also learned French, German, algebra, and history. Okay. You know what, I'm going to try to... Just let her run, Maybe we can stuff. just stop the video and send it to everyone. ...eat together in the annex. Then, at one o'clock, they would turn on the radio for the latest news from the BBC. The helpers would stay until about quarter to two, then go back to work. At that point, the people in hiding could have a nap. Anne used the time to study and to write. By about four o'clock, it was time for coffee and dinner preparations would start. The warehouse workers went home at 5.30. Their helper, Bette Voskal, usually popped in after that to ask if any of them needed anything. When she, too, had left for home at quarter to six, the people in hiding would spread out throughout the building. With everyone gone, they could emerge safely from their hiding place and even go into the front section of the building. Herman Van Pels would check the day's mail. Peter Van Pels fetched the bread left for them in the office. Otto Frank typed, presumably business letters. Margot and Anne did some office work for the helpers, such as filing letters, and August Van Pels and Edith Frank would cook the evening meal. They also washed themselves in the office kitchen, the only available hot water. After dinner, the group would read or chat or play games. The windows were blacked out as evening fell and preparations for the night began at nine. Furniture had to be moved to make rooms ready to sleep in. Just as in the morning, the group followed a strict schedule for the bathroom, one after another. Anne's turn was from nine to 9.30. 
After that, the secret annex gradually fell silent. I think that's it. Just go to the next one now. Okay. On the PowerPoint, yeah. Oops. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Anne and the others in hiding were frightened they'd be found. She wrote in her diary that one of the helpers, may, Victor Kugler, was concerned about house-to-house -house searches out, for hidden bicycles. See if I, let's see if I, the Nazi occupiers wanted all Dutch people to hand I kick in their people bikes, off, please come back unless in. they could hide so the door to the secret we'll annex. The chance of being discovered in such a raid was great. Do you know how to stop the video? But Victor suggested hiding the entrance no. behind a false no. cupboard. Bep Voskow's father, Johan, who was another of the helpers, built them one. The cupboard opened with a catch that could be lifted both from inside the secret annex and by the helpers. I think you should front. exit out of the presentation. Yeah, the rest of the doorway was covered with a wooden board and. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Well, you can keep going. Yeah, I need the, uh, the PowerPoint okay. back though. We're still here, but I guess the. Benson with the presentation is probably off, but he'll he'll come back in. Do you want to continue, Martin? Yeah, but uh, I need my. Mm. Rebecca, do you have it by any chance? Um, I do, and I can share my screen. Okay, so okay. why don't I? Yeah. Give me one second. While we're waiting, Benson, um, someone has a question. Was Margot's diary ever published? No, it was never found. We never found it. We don't know what happened. Um, okay. Oh, I, I'm not able to share my screen because the host has disabled participant screen sharing. I just made you um, co-host. Okay. There we go. Can everyone yeah. see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Dad, can you see this? Dad? Yeah. You can see this? Yes, yes. I'm fine. Go? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the tensions. If you can imagine the living with a total of eight people together, two families and an older gentleman, uh, the dentist was an older guy, for more than two years, there is going to be tensions. Okay. Um, First of all, the women didn't get, okay, now we're back, I think, yeah. The women didn't get along. Eden didn't get along with Gusty from Pels. Then Anne didn't get along with her mother. She writes about it in the diary. And for everything, she used to run to her father if she had problems with her mother. I mean, I gotta tell you, Otto Frank became a saint. He was the leader everybody came to him with their problems so uh, this was very difficult and very emotional for all of them then unfortunately august the 4th okay i cannot forward it can you Rekha? Mm -hmm. okay okay yeah, yeah. yeah leave it in there so august the 4th around 10 a.m in the morning suddenly three german nazi officers stormed into the house accompanied by three Dutch Nazis. They went straight for the famous bookcase behind which were the stairs to the annex. That's why we believe, and I'm part of that, that it was an inside job who be did the betrayal. Everyone was arrested and taken outside to a waiting arrest wagon from the Sicherheitsdienst, which was the SD, the secret police. Um, 
So they they uh, went to the SD headquarters. That's where they were a couple of nights. Then they went to another prison, uh, and then they went uh, about seven days later, a week. So maybe around August the 11th, 12th, they went on a train to the Dutch Transit camp called Westerbork. That's where everybody left for uh, the uh, destruction camps. And uh, I want to go back a little bit about uh, something happening between there that's significant. And I'm throwing up a theory out there that could have saved the lives of the girls. I'm not sure. The girls uh, were deported to Auschwitz on September the 3rd. And the last, this was the last train from the transit camp, Westerbork, to leave from the Netherlands. Um, why did the Nazis stop doing the deportations? Uh, one of my theories is in, in 1944, for s some of you who know a little bit about Holocaust history, um, Hungary, the country of Hungary had come on the Nazi side and the leader there had given permission uh, to uh, get a hold of all the Jews and transport, deport them to Auschwitz. And the guy in charge of that was uh, Adolf Eichmann. So we will get to that later a little bit, but so the Germans were very busy with that and Auschwitz had filled up. And I think that's why they stopped. So unfortunately, um, there was the last train they were on, and Otto uh, Frank was selected to do hard labor. Edith, uh, unfortunately, was really sent to the gas chamber. The girl survived, and uh, I don't think Miss uh, Van Pels survived, but he did, and the son Peter did, and but they died at the end of the war. So this September third, September the seventeenth, uh, we had in the city of Arnhem. Uh, it was the father was British. They were both of uh, noble, old noble families, and they were in the basement of their house. And she survived the war, but they obviously. Uh, there was a lot of damage, emotional damage. And she, she talks about that later on. So the Battle of Arnhem was, uh, now I'm going to just address this quickly. Um, four airborne divisions, the first British, the first Polish, the American 82nd and the American 101st were dropped around the city of Arnhem. And then together with assistance of the British 30th Armed Division, these were the tanks, they would establish a bridgehead in the city of Arnhem. From there, move into Germany, and then I'll get to in a minute what the plan was. Um, there was just a little problem. Mr. Uh, Marshall Montgomery had... Uh, the... It really is, of how that place is related. Well, okay. Not too long ago, I gave a presentation on a Saturday morning. Who is that? I'm not sure. Can everyone please mute. He left, but actually they were all very attentive. And of those 800 people that were watching the presentation. Okay, I got it. Okay, can we go back first now? Go back to where we were. Who is that? Rebecca, are you directing this? Go back. We're not in Bergen Belsen yet. Anyway, so yes, here we are. So um, there was just one little problem. And uh, Marshall Montgomery had driven Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, who, who was the commander in chief of all the Allied forces, had driven him crazy. He wanted to do this, and he said he could make this successful. Um, because he could get faster to Berlin than Patton, the American General Patton. They completely hated each other, so this was also a personal thing. And uh, on paper, it looked good. There was just one little problem. The Dutch underground had sent uh, a, a message to the Dutch government in exile in London 
that there were two major SS crack panzer divisions regrouping around the city of Artem. And this was uh, 25,000 men plus their tanks, their fam infamous tanks, I should say. So the Dutch sent the message to uh, uh, London, to the... Uh, exactly, exactly who is that? Someone, Someone needs to mute. mute. As, as the host, you can mute everybody but the speaker. Okay. All right. Looks like it disappeared. So the Dutch government sent a message to uh, the British. And we know from the movie and from the book, Operation Market Guy, Bridge Too Far, that the message was received by the intelligence head, uh, Montgomery's intelligence head, two days or three days before they would do the dropping on September the 17th, 1944, the message was relayed to uh, Montgomery, Marshall Montgomery. And he just put it to the side, too late. And he thought, you know, this can't be true, really. This is probably a fake message and something else involved. Oh, God, if he would have just listened. So um, it became a total disaster. And uh, lots of people lost their lives. Our airborne divisions did pretty good. Uh, but unfortunately, Americans lost their lives, too. Um, so here is the theory. Um, if that had gone well, they would have gone first uh, to the Ruhrgebiet in Germany, where the Dutch industrial Nazi machine was operating. And they could have taken that and then go straight up north to the city of Hamburg. They would have passed by, had to take Bergen Belsen. So Bergen Belsen is 234 miles from the city of Arnhem. Now remember what I said, the girls went to Bergen Belsen in the beginning of November. The, uh, the British could have been easily been in Bergen Belsen November the 1st. And so the camp might have been probably liberated already. All that didn't happen, unfortunately, and that's why uh, they still ended up in Bergen Belsen. Okay. Uh, so Otto Frank now is in Auschwitz and uh, not doing too well. He's 56 years old. He was beaten several times. He got sick and they put him in the infirmary in Auschwitz and somebody, another Jewish guy from uh, Amsterdam went to get a Jewish, also from Amsterdam doctor who was in another part of Auschwitz. Very risky what he did. He came to look at Otto and he gave him some medicine and probably sleep, pain medicine, sleep medicine. And he told Otto, you stay here in the infirmary. I don't want you to go anywhere. So now we're in the beginning of uh, 1945. And uh, they described that sometimes they could hear the Russian artillery already. It was still far away, but these were huge guns they had. So they knew the Russians were on the way, and so did the Germans. One morning, the Germans just had disappeared and left the camp. Everybody left them to fend for themselves, which was fine with them, of course. Then uh, about, I think it was January the 25th, suddenly these SS troops show up with trucks and machine guns, and everybody was told to line up. So. Everybody knew what was going to happen. They were going to be executed. Uh, they were about to do their thing when suddenly a Wehrmacht officer of higher rank than the SS officer appeared in the camp and told the SS officer to get the hell out of there and start fighting the Russians. Don't worry about this camp here. So the SS disappeared. So this is the second time that Otto Frank escaped death. And I think... I've always been, I've come to the conclusion that Hashem had something to do with it. All right, so then actually January 27th, uh, the Russians arrive, camp is liberated. They brought with them uh, the, the Russian Red Cross, so they got doctors, nurses, they finally got some decent feeding, and um, they started to move them out. Little by little, uh, there was about 40,000 people left in Auschwitz. So that's a lot of people. It took some time. So via Katowice in Upper Silesia, 
he arrived in the big port city of Odessa on the Black Sea. And from there, uh, they sailed in May, it was now already, they say, sailed to the big port city in France, Marseille, the south of France. He arrived there, and then they had to wait another week or so, and then Otto was put on a train to Amsterdam. Now, just imagine that he had left the Netherlands on uh, September the 3rd, 1944, and now we are uh, in, in June of 1945. So it took three days for the train to come to uh, Amsterdam, but it did. And uh, kind of typical of the way he was, Otto Frank, he arrived at the station. I don't know if there was a lot of cabs, taxis, I, I guess not. So he decided to walk. And you remember the map I showed you? It was only 15, 20 minute walk. And by that time he was really uh, pretty healthy. And he just walked in his office where he had been working and living. And they all, they all sat there stunned. And they went like, oh my God, where is the rest of the family? And Otto said, well, I came to ask you. Have you heard of anybody else? He said, I know that Edith died in Auschwitz, but where are the girls? And they say, we don't know. Do you know any, anybody else that uh, was in, in hiding in the annex? So um, then what they used to do is in uh, newspapers, they sent ads, they post ads. Have you seen my daughters, Margot and Anne? And he did that for uh, about a month. Uh, he would try to find somebody that had been in the Bergen Belsen survivors, which was not easy to do. The communications were still poor. But finally, through an acquaintance, that person told him, I think there is two women living in this address, also one of, um, one of the canals. And... Uh, they survived Bergen Belsen. They're two sisters. So on a, Otto Frank called, and uh, and the one lady who answered said, "Yeah, why don't you come over?" So on a Sunday, it was a beautiful day. He walked over, went to the house, and the woman asked him to sit down. And she and her sister were about 18, 19 years old, and had survived Bergen Belsen and knew Margot and Anne. And Otto Frank said, what do you know about my daughters? And there was this silence. And then she looked at him and she had to tell him, unfortunately, Mr. Frank, they died in Bergen Belsen. They will not be back. And there was a documentary about it I saw years ago. And the lady said uh, that, uh, his face turned completely white. He stood up and he thanked her and he walked away. So now at least he knew that they would never come back. He didn't have to do the search anymore. So he went back Monday, uh, Prinzengracht, you know, to go to work as he would always do every day. And Miep was there and he told Miep about what he had found out the day before. And uh, okay, here is, okay, hold on, those, just some of the pictures. Uh, so, okay, stay with this, Becca, stay with this. So there on the left is the diary. And Miep, Gies, had found the diary after the Germans had left and put it in their desk. And she had told everybody, uh, that diary is going to stay in the desk till Anne comes back. And if she doesn't come back, I'm going to destroy it. And she was really intent on doing that. And now that she knew that Anne wouldn't be back, she gave the diary to Otto. And, uh, and of course, he started to read it. And it was very painful. He had to uh, put it away several times. He couldn't finish. And... Uh, then he gave it to a friend to read, who, who was an author, a Dutch author, it was a couple actually. And 
and uh, they both said, wow, this is incredible. Her style of writing is, is so far advanced. This is almost like an adult is writing this. And they told Otto, this is, you need to do something with this. But he didn't want to hear about it, any publishing. He wasn't ready for that. Uh, but then in 1947, uh, somewhere in the beginning of 47, uh, on advice from somebody else, an excerpt was published in what was one of the major newspapers in Amsterdam, a paper that had been founded during the war. And the reactions were overwhelmingly very positive. And, and people started to say, oh, this is incredible. Is there more? We want to see more. And then uh, he tried to find a publisher. And the interesting thing is, two Dutch publishers turned them down. Ah, it's just a diary like you know, so many were written during the war. Well, it was not. But they didn't take the time really to, to, to look a little deeper into it. So finally, he found uh, a, a publisher on the right. You see uh, the way it was published for the first time, June the 15th. And that's when it appeared in the Netherlands. OK, let's go to the next one, Becca. OK. Um, <clears throat> so after it appeared in the Netherlands, it, uh, shortly after that, uh, Otto Frank allowed for uh, publication in English. And interesting, the uh, publication English happened first in the United States, not in the United Kingdom. And the lady who did the translation was more uh, familiar with the American English than with the Oxford English, shall we say. So later on, when the British edition appeared, they had to get another person for the translation because it was set in England, it looks too much uh, like an American <laughs> translation and, and the British are not going to like that. Remember, this was mostly for teenagers, of course, and meant for teenagers. Everybody started reading it, you know. So um, then it was published in German, uh, in, in France, and he kept himself busy and he realized now that, as he said one time, this is what Anne would have wanted me to do. I'm convinced she wanted me to publish this because if you remember in the diary when she wrote that maybe later in life she would be a famous author, you know, uh, she was really into writing and she would have been, if she would have survived, a very good author. We, we are all convinced of that. So by 1952, it got a little too, the pressure got a little too much in Amsterdam for Otto. You know, he was constantly called for interviews and he got thousands of letters already. And so he decided to move to Basel, Switzerland. Uh, he was now 63. Uh, also, his mother was living there and his sister, Lini, with her family. And he wanted to be with them because that's the only family he had left. So, of course, you know, you want to be with your family. Then in 1953 was another very important year in his life. Otto Frank married a woman, Fritzi Markowitz, also from Amsterdam originally. She had lost her husband and a son in Auschwitz. She had one daughter, Eva, who is still alive as far as I know. And I've seen her uh, on a speaking engagement. I mean, I was not really there, but I saw the advertising for a synagogue in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and Otto Frank later stated that this was a much better marriage than his first one. So then we're going to 1955 and we're going to Broadway. And Otto Frank had traveled to the United States, did all the negotiations uh, pretty much himself. Uh, it was very pr problematic at first, but uh, he put his foot down how he wanted it. So the, pl the play arrived on Broadway the Diary of Anne Frank with Susan Strasberg in the role of Anne. Maybe some of you are old enough to remember that. And it was an immediate hit in New York City. Alone, there were one million visitors and it won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, 1956, we have the premieres in Sweden and Germany. And it left a deep impression. In most towns in Germany, after the play was over, 
There was no applause. People sat in stunned silence, which tells you something. Okay, next one, Becca. Okay, now we're back to Audrey Hepburn. So, George Stevens, a famous producer in Hollywood, uh, was asked by Otto to make a movie too. And one of the reasons was he wanted Anne to be played by Audrey Hepburn. Now, Audrey Hepburn, like we just talked about, uh, had survived the war, thank goodness, in the city of Arnhem. And then as soon as the war was over, she moved to London. And got, she was really a ballet dancer, got involved in more ballet, uh, and then did some other plays. And then she did well there. She got good uh, reviews. And that's how she ended up in uh, the United States, as you all know, in some very famous movies with Gary Grant. Um, so she lived in Switzerland as well. So they met one time. And Otto almost backed her to play Anne. Now, the interesting thing is, Audrey Hepburn is also from 1929, the same year as Anne. But she told Otto, you know, I'm almost, I'm almost 30 years old. I'm really too old for this. And also, emotionally, that would drain me. I just, she told Otto, I'm sorry, I can't do it. It would just drain me so much because I've gone through the war in, in the Netherlands and etc. So we can all understand that. So the role was given to 19 year old, if you all recall, Millie Perkins. And the movie became an immediate success. Uh, there were eight Oscar nominations and they won, they won three of them. I forgot which one, I think best movie. And uh, I think Shelley Winters won for best supporting actress, etc. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so 1950, oh, meanwhile, okay, that we left that out. And meanwhile, uh, there was a premiere of the movie in Amsterdam. And Otto Frank traveled from, uh, and his wife traveled from Switzerland to Amsterdam. And it was uh, also the Queen Juliana of the Netherlands was there. And uh, the mayor, of course, of Amsterdam City Council, everybody was there. It was a huge success. So now, Back to the, the place where it all started. 263 Prinzelgracht was purchased by a developer who wanted to tear it down and build apartments. Well, some influential, influential Jews in Amsterdam found out and they immediately went to the city council, to the mayor, and said, this, this, we can't do this. This should be, uh, you know, this has to do with the Holocaust. We should save this building. And the mayor agreed, he said, but, how we're going to get the money all together? We, you know, we're going to give you some money, but you need to raise money too. So he immediately went to the United States, where there was a lot of money, right? Still is, and a lot of uh, Jews donated, and uh, so then Otto Frank gave ten thousand dollars, and the city of Frankfurt, where Anne was born, gave five thousand dollars, and like I said, Amsterdam, city of Amsterdam, the mayor donated the rest. And they managed to save the building. And then they started to refurbish and made a museum out of that. It was opened again in 1960. 1963, there was another major development in the case. Simon Wiesenthal, uh, you probably all know who that is, the famous Nazi hunter, discovered that the arresting officer in 1944 with the name of Karl Zilberbauer, worked for the SD, was now working as a regular officer at the Viennese police force. So he told everybody who wanted to know, got into all the papers. And uh, I remember it was in the papers in the Netherlands and of course in the United States, all over the world, Israel. And the Dutch decided to send investigators, police investigators to Vienna. I forgot to mention there was the first major police investigation was in 1949 in the, in the Netherlands. Also, Otto Frank had asked for that. So now we're in uh, 1963, and uh, Otto Frank is uh, 74 now. Uh, he's an older guy. He's gone through a lot of his life, and he was not very enthusiastic about this. Now, you might find this strange, 
you know, this is his own daughter. And of course, deep in his heart, he wanted to find out who did the betrayal. But mind you, 74 years old, everything he had gone through, uh, this whole thing had been so emotional for him. Uh, you know, first the diary, then the play, then the movies, and then all the letters he got. And he used to answer every letter single-handedly himself. He used to write it. No typewriting thing. So he kind of lay back and Simon Wiesenthal got upset. He didn't like that. And he, he you know, he got on Otto Frank's case. Simon Wiesenthal was also an Auschwitz survivor. So he, he just couldn't understand it, you know. But after what I just explained, I think you will understand that he, uh, he politely had to decline. And uh, so there was the investigation for two years, three years. And unfortunately, uh, the case, uh, first I should say, what we found out from Zilberbauer, that his boss, a guy by the name of Dietman, the head of the SD in Amsterdam, had told him that when the infamous telephone call came in that betrayed the people hiding in the annex, it was a female voice. He said that's all he knew. So if he was telling the truth, we don't know, but it was a female voice. And that's all they had to go on. And again, they interviewed everybody again. And some of them were not even living in this country anymore, in the Netherlands anymore. So it was difficult and they couldn't find anything. Uh, and, you know, I'm of the opinion that they didn't do enough of a, of a real police investigation. Uh, for instance, in 1949, everybody was still alive. Everybody that was working in the warehouse was alive. I could have heard the noise. Um, you know, these people um, could have made a difference, but they didn't cross-examine them. It's a major mistake. You know, any, any, anybody that is a, a beginning detective in a police force will tell you, that's the first thing you need to do. Who said what? And then you compare. I also think uh, they should have done polygraph tests. By 1945, these machines were much more advanced than when they were invented, I think, in the 1920s. Uh, it's not 100% proof, but, you know, maybe uh, we could have found something, you know, nothing was done like that. So they had to close the case, unfortunately, uh, in 1966. Now, the other thing is, uh, and Miep Mans Miep Gies mentions that in her book about the whole case, that when they would go out shopping, you know, the, uh, the shop owner started to get suspicious because Meep had just married and it was just her and her husband and they had no children. And here she come buying meat for <laughs> eight people and the butcher let it out one day. He said, I think I know what you're doing there. Trust me, it's, my lips are sealed. It will be good with me. But how about the other... Uh, you know, the, the grocery store, the bakery store, you know, people talk. And, and uh, the unfortunate thing is that, as I said before, that Otto Frank took a huge, God bless him, Baruch Hashem, took a huge ri risk by, instead of the original four, now have eight people. And, and like I said before, more than likely contributed to the betrayal. Will we ever find out? I talked to David uh, about that, the expert in the Netherlands. He doesn't think so. Uh, there is a commission was instituted in 2018. Uh, there was uh, retired police officers, uh, other investigators, even two FBI agents came over from the United States. They were experts in cold cases. They were supposed to submit a report on August the 4th, 2019, which is the 75th anniversary of the arrest of everybody there. 
they didn't come out with the report and David told me they're still working on it. I got to tell you, honestly, I don't think we will ever find out, unfortunately. It's everybody's dead. That's the number one thing. And, and if we couldn't find out in 1949 or in 1963, we, uh, you know, we're not going to find out now. So then the last thing, uh, Otto Frank in the, in the uh, late 60s and this, all through the 70s, he spent as much as his time he could to uh, organizations that had to do with, uh, uh, you know, things, uh, human, whatever, uh, answering letters. He uh, answered all the letters he got himself. He did not have a secretary. He did not even ask his wife. So there's thousands and thousands of Otto Frank letters still around somewhere. And of course, all these teenagers have grown up now. Uh, and unfortunately, 1980, beginning of 1980, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, I don't think he smoked. So I don't know what that, that could have been, you know, the result. Uh, more than two years sitting in cramped compartments and he passed away at the age of 91. I mean, he, he still made it after everything he went through, he still made it to the age of 91. So that's basically my presentation. I want to thank uh, some people. First of all, uh, my daughter, Rebecca, oh, pictures of the Anne Frank house. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for the PowerPoint. You did an outstanding job. Um, here are the books from David Barno I told you about, and they are on Amazon, The Diary of Anne Frank, The Critical Edition, and The Phenomenon of Anne Frank, all by David Barno, and the first book he also, another guy from that foundation, uh, Gerald van der Stroom. Martin, thank you very much. For the I, I will take any questions. Martin, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. I, there was one question that uh, it was in the chat. It's actually, it was two parts. Uh, yeah. was, Mar um, was Margot's diary ever published and whatever happened to Margot? And I think you already answered the question about Margot. She died in the camps. Yes. And, and I, in addition, I'd like to ask a question. Wouldn't the fact that there was a second building next to, attached to the office, that wouldn't that have caused suspicion anyways, if it, if what people over the period of years? That if it was an empty building and they yeah, it's even been mentioned also by David. It could have been such a simple thing that the neighbors, you know, they had neighbors in the back. Um, if you lived there for two years and and you know, during the day, the, the windows were covered, and at night uh, they uh, used only candlelight. Uh, so. There might have been something that uh, a neighbor could have called the S SD. Because the other thing is, uh, there was a lot. Of, if you turned in a Jew, there was a lot of money you would get. Uh, it was war; people were suffering. They needed money. So, you know, um, we don't know. But again. And other people agree with me on this. We think it was an inside job because they came in and as Mipchi said, they went straight for that bookcase. Now, if you don't know that uh, the annex, I mean, why would you go straight for the bookcase? You investigate the house in the front, the facing the canal first, right? If you have a suspicion that there is Jews hiding because you know, there was the bookcase and it looks like there was nothing behind it. Yeah, there was a house behind it. So, again, uh, I, I still think it was an inside job. So, the, going back to the next the question, the first question that was on the chat was, what was Margot's diary ever published? And uh, another question came in about whatever happened to Peter. And I guess that the question would be, whatever happened to the other families? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, Margot had a diary and we didn't find it. Uh, we don't know what happened to it. Meep didn't have it. And she, as, as soon as the, uh, the officers were gone from the arrest, they, they went, she went upstairs. She was the first one. And, but the thing she found was uh, Anne's diary. 
she didn't find Margot's diary and maybe she took it with her. I, I don't know. We don't have it. Interesting also, I forgot to mention, Otto Frank started the diary in Auschwitz. And after he was liberated, he kept track of all the traveling he did, everything, you know, that was never published. I don't even know where it is. This probably, there is also an Anne Frank Foundation in Switzerland. He founded that, Otto. It might be there. I don't know. And what was the, the, the other question? The, the, the question okay. So the other question was what happened to Peter? And if, if, I'll extend the question to what happened to the other families, you know, if, if you know. Uh, so we know for a fact, Edith Frank uh, went to the gas chamber. And most likely uh, Mrs. Van Pels also. Uh, Mr. Van Pels apparently survived, uh, but died towards the end of the war, also in Auschwitz. Peter Van Pels survived everything. He was only 19 years old in 1945. But he was sent on one of those infamous marches. You know, when they started to empty the camps, they, uh, the, the Nazis moved as many people as they could westward, away from where the fighting would be. And uh, he was put on one of those marches. And it was, you know, winter. The winter of 1944, 1945, very cold winter. Almost like what we have here now in the last couple of days. Very cold. You know, I remember on these marches, they didn't have enough, uh, they didn't have the proper clothes, they didn't have the proper shoes. So he perished uh, on one of those marches. Uh, the dentist also uh, was more, we, we're not exactly sure, but most likely since he was an other, an older guy who was guest in uh, Auschwitz. That's all we know. Uh, um, so some of the author, some pe people or authors suggest that Otto revised or deleted some entries that, that, that and the question was, do you agree? Uh, yeah, when the, the diary first came out, there was a lot of personal information in there that he left out on purpose. I would have done the same. Uh, there was the criticism of Anne about her mother, and that her mother and her father didn't really get along, blah, blah, blah. And she talked about sexual items. So, you know, we're in 1947. Uh, so that was all clearly left out. It, it, it would not have been a publisher. The, he would have never found a publisher publishing all that. And he didn't want that out. That was, so that all, if you want to read the diary, you have to read the, uh, the latest version where there is a lot more information that has been released uh, by the Anne Frank Foundation in Amsterdam. They have the rights to the diary. And uh, the latest edition has all, more of almost all the information that was left out in 1947. And um, next question was, how do we know that the Nazis went straight to the bookcase? How do we know that information? Oh, me please. Okay, and the office manager, they went straight, she said, without hesitation. Okay, and um, you had a... Uh, Martin, this is Aaron Goldstein. I have a question, a couple of questions. One, yeah. you said that Jan Gies, the husband of me, got the extra food coupons. Where did he work again? The social services in Amsterdam. So that's how they got the extra food rations. Yes. yes. And what happened to the helpers? I mean, I understood that if you helped Jews that you were executed. So why didn't those people, why weren't they, why wasn't there retribution against the people who were the helpers in the office? They uh, very good question. Um, and Mikris almost got arrested and deported herself. Uh, but remember what I said, she, uh, she was fluent in German. So the next day after the arrest, August the 5th, she went to the, uh, the head of, of the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, the Secret Service Dienst in uh, Amsterdam. And she, this was a big building and she came in the entrance and uh, she wanted to ask to the, uh, the man in charge. And the officer asked her what for? I was a German and she answered him and she started talking German with him. Well. Uh, there were some friends of mine who were picked up yesterday, and I want to see if I can get them released. So she tried to get them, you know, out of the arrest, out of the prison there. 
and he just pointed upstairs go up the stairs and then you see a door and uh, you go in there and that's where they are so she did can you imagine the chutzpah i mean <laughs> this was very gutsy and she walks in and here is Zilberbauer and his boss Dietman and a couple of other Nazis there. It's a big table in the center of the room and they're listening to Radio Orange. There was a broadcast that came almost every day from London. And, and you were not allowed, as a Dutch citizen, you were not allowed to listen to that. And she walked in and she had started to talk in German and they looked and, and then one of the asked, where did you learn to speak German? And you have a Viennese accent. Well, she said, that's where I'm from originally. So she asked them, what are the chances that they can be released? And, you know, these are my friends, blah, blah, blah. And this dick man, he was not a pleasant guy. He told her in no uncertain terms, you better get the hell out of here or I'll have you arrested. So she had to leave. Uh, there was a comment in the chat that basically said, uh, I'm not going to pronounce it, the woman May, May Gies, uh wrote an interesting book describing yes. her life. And uh, she also wrote about the life helping the uh, people in the annex. And, uh, yes. and so this person was po very positive about the, uh, her book. Yes. Um, th does anyone else have any questions that yes. they'd like to ask? This, this is Ma Martin. This is Robert from Amsterdam. Yes. Big com for compliments for what you just did. Excellently done. Yes. I want to mm -hmm. give a tiny little perspective. Yes. Uh, I was born 400 meters away from what you have discussed in 1950. Yeah. My parents, yeah. thanks to God, uh, survived uh, Westerbork. And they found out later they were not on the last train where Anne was on. They were on the list of the train to go next week, which never left. Oh. Otherwise, I would not be on this phone call. Well, and for the you. other people involved, Martin and I met working in Washington, D.C. for Hyatt Regency. Mm -hmm. And Martin met Ida, the mother of you, lovely Rebecca, and you stayed at our home in Antwerp. <laughs> so there's quite a connection here. I don't have a question. I have one last thing uh, to mention. Uh, visiting Anne Frank's uh, museum now, I was most impressed all the way at the end of the exhibition, and I'm paraphrasing because unfortunately I cannot recall exactly how he said it, but Otto Frank said, and there's a tape of his voice, as father, I found out how little as parents we know of our children. Yeah, absolutely true. And I think that's one of the most profound statements I ever heard a parent yeah. say. Yeah. So thank you again, Martin. Bless you. Bless everybody. You're okay. welcome. So, so Martin, we have two questions, and these will be the last two questions for the uh, uh, program. Um, what the first question was: Was there other Jews in Amsterdam who made it in hiding through the war that we know about? Yes. And there were plenty. There were plenty. Uh, but most of the Jews went into hiding outside Amsterdam. They used connections because, you know, obviously Amsterdam was full with uh, Germans, with Nazis and, and Dutch Nazis. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the conclusions David Barno told me of the investigation, uh, the last investigation by these guys that's still going on, that they found a lot of Dutch Nazis living in the center uh, of Amsterdam, probably close to uh, 263 Prinzengracht. So, but they, uh, um, you know, in Yad Vashem, for those who have been there, and I was there in uh, 1996, uh, uh, the righteous Gentiles, there was a lot of uh, Dutch names there, thank goodness. On, on top is the uh, I can't recall the family name now, but this this was a big farmer's family in the Netherlands. They were very religious. They were Christians, very religious. And they they said it was their task, it's in the Bible, that you should uh, risk your life to save your fellow human being. And, and they did. 
they, they saved a lot of Jews. And unfortunately, uh, two of uh, the farmers were, arrest, were, were caught and were arrested and died in concentration. Well, thank you very much, Martin. This, uh, we're going to um, very much, we'll end the program here, but it was just an excellent presentation. And, and, Mar and Margaret David, thank you very much for doing this for us. Can, and, can I add one more short thing, please? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Martin? Yeah. One of, the, one of the few things you didn't mention, but maybe for people who might not know this. So a lot of people, they were not necessarily against the Jews in Holland. But the Germans paid seven and a half dollars in those days for any person who gave the name or the hiding place of Jews. Yeah. So it was financially an extremely uh, favorable thing to do. Yeah, I so mentioned. That's one of the main reasons, or you, maybe you mentioned, and I missed it, I'm sorry yeah. for that, but that's one of the main reasons why so many people were turned in. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is a bad statistic, but from all uh, the countries where uh, the Nazis were occupied, so, you know, we're talking about the Netherlands, Belgium, France, uh, Denmark, and Norway, uh, we had one of the highest amounts of betrayals because, as you, as you so correctly stated, uh, there was a lot of money to be made if you turned in Jews. And so unfortunately that's what happened. Okay, well, thank you very much, Martin. And thank, thank you for everyone for joining us. And uh, we'll, uh, we have an, other programs that'll be coming up and we'll be sending out announcements on that. Thank you very much and have yeah, everybody. I'm, I'm already working on the next one. That will be the history of the Sephardic Jews in Amsterdam. It's very, uh, very interesting. That's, so, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So everybody have a good day. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Martin. Bye -bye. Very interesting. Bye-bye. Great job. What's that?